In Hebrews 13, 5, we read, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. As you know, if you clicked here, this video is about covetousness or covetousness. Uh, I'm sorry, I said the same thing over again. Some of you may not be familiar with this term, and so I thought I would take a moment to define it. Coveting is when you want something that you don't have. It belongs to somebody else. Coveting is not, it should not be confused with something that you need. I mean, if you need to buy food, if you need to buy clothing, that's one thing. But what type of food you're buying, what type of clothing you buy, may have something to do with covetousness uh, that you are seeing in others, what they have, what you see in a store window that you can't afford, or that maybe you shouldn't afford. Uh, that's what credit cards are for, right? Uh, praise God, he delivered me from that a long time ago, and uh, not the easy way either. And so anyway, we want to look at this a little bit. Covetousness is a very, very bad thing, and it has truly crept into the church. And I have seen this as part of the end times description of the church. And, you know, you may have a differing opinion on that, but I keep seeing covetousness and idolatry in the descriptions of things that are very important at the end. Now, before going on, I just want you to know it's a startling thing to see. Covetousness is idolatry. In other words, if you want that car, you know, you have a car already, it's doing well for you, but uh, you need something a little bit better, a little bit nicer. Oh, I want that car. Oh, if I can just... If I just put a bigger down payment or whatever, uh, there you have it. Uh, that's coveting, and you would be idolizing the car, something, uh, something that you know you want to have. But this is straight from Scripture. This isn't just an opinion. Sometimes, of course, a lot of things could be an idol. And so we read this from. I'm just taking this from Colossians three five. Mortify. That is kill, put to death, crucify, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. This is also in Ephesians 5.5 5, that lists the same description for you know covetousness being idolatry. Now that's a very serious thing when we start to think about it that way, because both idolatry and covetousness are in the commandments. There are only 10 commandments, but the second commandment is about idolatry, and the 10th commandment is about coveting. And so I think we need to take these things very seriously. And uh, as far as I see this as a sign of the end, one of the things that I see, of course, as you know, we are dealing with this prosperity gospel. It just seems to be all over the place. People love it. I mean, they love the Joel Osteens, the Joyce Myers, uh, the Kenneth Copelands, all of these prosperity gospel teachers. Now, that's, that's America. But over here in Africa, even though they may not have the names, that's pretty much what's going on. It's a prosperity gospel. Uh, when you serve the Lord, you will get rich. If you give money to the Lord, he will give you twice as much back. It's very covetous, and it is not biblical. It's not biblically based. They are twists of scripture. Uh, another time, another thing that I see as far as a sign of the end, I just take this from, uh, this is Revelation chapter 3, verses uh, 16 and 17 specifically. It's 15 through 19. Again, I, I have this information in the description at the bottom of the page, so please feel free to take your time and look at it and look it up. Uh, you don't have to memorize all this or, or go back over the video with a fine-tooth comb uh, to dig it out. But here we have the last church. And many times these, these seven churches of Revelation are looked at as church ages. And so the, seven one is, the seventh one is the church of the Laodiceans. And they are being rebuked. They are the lukewarm church that Jesus says he will vomit them. He will spew them from his mouth. They just make him sick because they are lukewarm and neither hot or cold. And so then you're saying, well, well why did they make him why did they make him uh, so sick? Well, you know, what was offensive that they were lukewarm? He says, because you say, because you say, I am rich and increased with goods 
and have need of nothing. That's the result of being covetous. They were a covetous church who loaded up on their earthly wealth. And they didn't need God. I mean, they really didn't. They were probably blessing him. Oh, God gave me my riches. But that's not faith. You cannot serve God and mammon. Please remember that scripture. God will give us everything that we need, but he's not going to give everything that we kind of lust after with our eyes. That is not what the scripture says, and we should be putting this away. And so we see this even from this, you know, potentially last church age. They are a covetous generation. They preach the prosperity gospel and they are rich. But I see this also in some various descriptions of the last days. Uh, for example, I see it in Romans 129. If you read this from Romans chapter 1 in that area, it's giving a vast description of the type of people that are, uh, maybe I shouldn't say type of people, I should say the qualities of the people, uh, different attributes that they have. And one of those is being covetous. Another one is being idolatrous. And so whenever we see either one of these, they are interchangeable. And it's really all over in these last days. People have grown discontent with eternity and they want things in the here and now. One of my key verses, one of my key sections that I focus on for this is from 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says how in the last days perilous times will come. And it says that men will be lovers of their own selves. That's kind of a general description. Then it gets into uh, some more specific. The first specific one it has, of course, men will be lovers of their own selves. First one, covetous. First one is covetous. And there is another one that is very, very, very important. And that is, it's in, this, in that same verse two. I think it goes through verses two, three, and four with these different attributes. But if this is in also the first, uh, the, the first of those three verses, it is, they are unthankful. This is absolutely in line. It, it just kind of goes hand in hand with covetousness. You're not content with what you have. And like our opening scripture said from Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation, conversation in this, in this text means, context means your lifestyle. Let your life be without coveting, but be content with the things that you have. We can see this again in places such as Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Paul is writing how he has learned to be content with whatever he has. He has learned to be hungry. He has learned to be full. He is content. And this is something, you know, my wife and I really had to learn as, as the Lord was teaching us in our lives. I was just the same. I would be coveting. I would say, oh, I, I really want this, you know. But was it necessary? Uh, as we got down to the end, as we were being more frugal with our money in America, as you know now, we were in Botswana, we were being more frugal with our money. I come to the place where I needed uh, another, I needed a cordless drill. The one I had had for years kind of went out, and I had determined, uh, the first one I had was a Ryobi, and uh, I had determined I wanted a Dewalt. It's a very good drill, I'm familiar with it, but it's expensive. It's much more expensive than, than the Ryobi had been, and... But that's what I wanted. And I was trying to wait for a sale. Usually on sale, you could get one for about $100. And, uh, but one day I'm walking through Walmart and I see there they have their own brand of drill for less than $20. In other words, I could get five of these things for the price of one Dewalt. Will it be as good as a Dewalt? Absolutely not. I mean, it will be a little short. But will it be good enough for my need? That's the real question. See, God's going to supply the need. And in fact, I did pray it through. I purchased it and uh, it, it fit our needs wonderfully. I mean, no, it was not a Dewalt. I could tell some differences, but I thought it was very, very good. And for the price, you know, how could you go wrong? So instead of coveting, now, strictly speaking, I wasn't just coveting. I mean, I had experience with this and I thought this is a good quality, but you know, I didn't absolutely need it. God will supply your need. And so many times this is linked into, we're not thankful for what we have. We're not thankful for the car we have that gets us from point A to point B. We need something fancier. We need something like our friend has. Now, I can't even say that because there may be people who are on the road a lot of their lives for their business, and they may need something a little better just because they spend so many hours in their vehicle. 
I can't judge that. But I'm just saying a lot of times uh, that is an example of what it would mean to be covetous. I also wanted to read this scripture from Psalm chapter 10, verse 3, just to show how God feels. I mean, I didn't spend a lot of time going back into the Old Testament. I was trying to keep this uh, succinct. But listen to this. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. That means hate, okay? <laughs> the wicked the wicked bless those who are coveting. And, uh, and the Lord hates when people are coveting. That just shows exactly, I mean, would it be in the commandments if God didn't despise coveting? So I just wanted to give you some examples of this so that you would know. Again, I have alluded to this already. People are unthankful. Let us not be unthankful. Let's look at what the Lord has given us already. And yes, if we need more for some reason, we need an upgrade, you know, bring it to him with a humble heart. He will supply your need. And I know that he will. Uh, as we see here, we've, we've watched in some of the churches, let's say, as we've been here in Africa, loud sound systems. It seems like, you know, most churches, actually the one we've attended most in Botswana hasn't had a loud sound system. They've had none. Praise the Lord for that. I mean, but uh, what it is, is they see this. They might see this from their satellite dishes or wherever. They see these loud, cool sound systems and they've got to have it. And they keep everything cranked up. They don't even need a PA system. Most of these churches are so small, but they have to have this. And as poor as they are, as dismal as the offerings are, they have a, they have a loud sound system. So that would be something coveting that isn't really needed. I think I've also said already about uh, the church I know that was trying to buy their pastor a glass pulpit. He wanted a glass pulpit, though he had a good wood pulpit. Why does he want a glass pulpit? I guess it looks cool. It's nice, but he already has what he needs. He's being covetous. Isn't there something better like, you know, feeding the poor, spreading the gospel you could do with, you know, the, the $600 or so that you're going to spend for a glass pulpit? Uh, in some ways, you're right. I mean, I shouldn't be judging that, but it's pretty clear to see it. he doesn't need another pulpit. He's already well taken care of. Something else I just thought of was uh, sports trophies. I attended a church back in America. I was very, very proud of their softball teams. Softball was very big in our area. And uh, probably most of you know what that is. That is a derivative of baseball. I'm not sure how many are watching me over here in Africa. They might not know what it is. But what happened is every year when softball season came around, we would have people showing up for church that weren't there any other time of year. And the reason they did that is because one of the requirements was you had to attend Sunday service in order to play the games during the week. And so because they wanted to play softball, they would start attending church. And typically these guys were pretty good. I mean, they were, we would call them ringers. They were very good. And so the church would espouse this also that they could get their trophies. Uh, in their sanctuary now, they have this big trophy case with all the things that they have won for their softball achievements. Uh, as we had talked about already, we talked about the, the uh, car being coveting after a car. Also, you could covet after a job. Again, one of the uh, uh, women that I had counseled, I had met uh, working at a store. She had said how, how she wanted this other job. She had actually had the job, but because of the whole COVID thing, I guess some things fell through. She wasn't getting enough business and so now she's you know, working at a, a store. But the thing is, she has a job and her husband has a job and their kids are with them. And so, I mean, she wanted the job and I'm not saying it was wrong to want that job back, but I got that sense that she really wasn't being so thankful, first of all, for what she has. And that's really a problem. I mean, God's, God's uh, trying our hearts, trying to see how thankful we really are. There was nothing wrong with what she had. It just wasn't what she wanted. I can't evaluate everything from one job to the next, but this is just an example for you to think on. Also in marriage, we have seen someone kind of advertising. It's uh, in a local forum here online. Someone saying how, you know, a woman looking for a man, he has to have a car, he has to have a home and property has to have a job and this and that. Of course, in America, we mostly 
marry for love. You know, we, you know, we get along well and things seem to go well. Here, of course, there's uh, some more complications. Sometimes uh, there is the expectation of a dowry that the husband is supposed to pay the, the wife's family, things like that. So I can't judge that either. But sometimes, even in America, it's like that. Well, I want a man who has, has made it. Or a man saying, you know, I want a woman who has made it. It could go either way. But it's just an example of what it means to covet. So one of the biggest things I would just advise you is I'd advise you, you know, don't model yourself after other people. This is one of the biggest things. Like when I think about the pastor that wants the glass pulpit or you want a loud sound, sound system, these people see television. They have satellite dishes and they see what's going on. And so they see what they have and they say, I want it too. And they hear some of these people say, wow, I have, I bought a jet for $60 million. You know, we've heard of that and stuff. But whatever it is, that fuels the covetousness when we're watching other people. And here in our area in particular, this is a very touristy area. So the people that come in are typically, you know, pretty well to do. They're on vacation. They're looking around and people say, wow, I, I want what they have. You know, I want what they have. But for our our well-being, we should be saying, Lord, what do I have already? What have, What have you given me? Instead of saying, okay, I need this. Father, have you given me anything already that, that I can make do with? And you would be amazed at the things God will show you. But he will give you that which you truly need if you pursue after him. He is not a stingy God by any means. But he wants to teach us to be grateful, thankful, holy children. This is what he's trying to raise. And again, I just can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Be thankful. Be thankful for what you have. He will supply your need. He has promised to supply your need. If you will just put him first, he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Remember that in, I believe it's Luke eleven three, 3, when Jesus is giving the example of, of prayer to his disciples. I like that, the way it's said there. He says, you know, he's saying, Father, give us day by day our daily bread day by day. Most of the time today, people, we don't want daily bread. We want to be assured of daily bread for months or years to come. That is not faith, and that's not what God has promised. But he will never leave us nor forsake us, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, of whom shall I be afraid? May God bless you uh, with this message.